Hi, I'm Charlie Montotoyella with Blue Bear Flutes and our website BlueBearFlutes.com where we have some of the latest and greatest Native American flutes available. Uh, this is week one of my How to Play the Native American Flute class. This is a 12 week long series and each week we go over a specific focus of the class and we also practice some basic things in each and every class like how to hold the flute, how to sit up straight, how to breathe properly, playing the scale, and so on and so on. And we also have a specific technique that we go over, or sometimes more than one, in each and every class. So today, uh, today's class is parts of the flute and minor troubleshooting. This class is intended to get you familiar with the Native American flute that you either have, you're about to have, or that you're interested in. And in this case, it'll show you everything that you need to know on how to use this wonderful instrument, how to take care of it, and what have you. Um, the first thing I'd like to do, as we should start with each and every class, is practice holding the flute. Now, for a beginner, holding the flute and how you hold the flute is probably the most difficult thing to grasp. Uh, I mean that facetiously, of course, too, because you're grasping the flute. But as you're holding the flute, a lot of times when people take their fingers off the holes, they feel like they're going to drop the flute. And with the techniques that I use, of course, you're never going to feel that way because each and every class, like I say, we're going to go over this as it will instill a good habit in your mind and in your hands on how to hold and how to play this wonderful instrument. So if you would, if you're capable of it, and I realize some people with disabilities may not be able to, but if you can sit up straight and breathe preferably through your nose, once again, if there's a difficulty in that, you know, result to whatever you have to, uh, to, uh, to get some air in your body, but breathing through your nose is the way that we tend to like to to get your air for playing an instrument. And uh, it allows you to fill up your lungs the most that you possibly can. And if you'll watch me, I don't always breathe through my nose either. But the reason that I need to stress that is because uh, as you develop habits, you either develop good habits or you develop bad habits. And if you can develop the habit of breathing through your nose more often, you will get more air filling up your lungs and uh, make basically a lot better flute player, I believe. So make sure that you do that. Deep breath. When you hold the Native American flute, this body of the flute here usually has either five or six holes. If you have a six hole flute that requires a piece of leather or a cover over this hole, or if your flute maker or instruction sheet that came with your flute or someone even told you that you need to keep that hole covered all the time to make it play the scale properly and that you might eventually advance to using that fingering, for the entire duration of all of our classes, I'm gonna tell you to please keep that covered. Uh, all of our classes are going to be based on using the modern six-hole flute that you have uh, with that finger that's supposed to be covered all the time, or they're going to be based on playing the five-hole flute. Uh, the five-hole Native American flute's been around as long as the original six-hole flutes have. What I call the modern six-hole flute is the one that you have to keep that hole covered. So, with all that out of the way, grasp the flute, cover the holes with your fingers like this, and you want to be able to feel the fingerings underneath each and every finger. If you can't feel the fingerings, the holes under your fingers, that means you may not be covering them thoroughly. If you clamp down on it too tight, you may be covering it so hard that eventually you'll develop a cramp. Once again, that's a bad habit. and We should make sure we cover it thoroughly, but not so tight that you're going to hurt yourself. And you do not have to concern yourself with the alleged Piper's grip with a Native American flute. You can do that if you like. If you've been told to do that, go for it. Otherwise, it's not something I, I promote. Uh, so cover the holes, and as soon as you get all the holes covered, uncover them. This process of covering the holes and uncovering them and keeping your fingers close to the, to the fingerings is going to teach your hands where to place your fingers. So you can do it without even looking at the flute. If you practice this, every time you pick your flute up, you pick it up, you cover the holes, take your fingers off the holes. This is going to develop a athletic memory, it's called, in your fingers that is going to make sure that you never misalign or miscover a hole. And also, uncovering all the holes allows you to play the first and easiest note on any Native American flute, and usually on almost any instrument, uh, especially flutes. The most convenient and easiest fingering to play is all holes open. That's with no holes covering the holes. No fingers covering the holes. 
you blow through the top of the flute, it makes a sound like that. If your flute's higher in tone or lower in tone, this is still going to be the relative highest note that you're going to be able to make without doing some advanced fingering techniques. So as you're blowing through that uh, flute and you're uncovering all the holes, the first hole you want to cover is this top one. The next one, while keeping the top hole covered, cover the next hole. And I know for many of you, if you are already familiar with the fingerings of your flute, this may be a very simple technique, maybe a very simple step for you. Please hang around. We do have greatly advanced techniques uh, waiting for you. We just uh, need to make sure we get everybody up to speed. So as you cover these holes, you need to make sure that you don't partially cover any of the holes in the process. If you do that, that's what it's going to sound like. And trust me, <laughs> I'll never do that again for you. We don't want it to sound that way. Uh, so make sure that you cover the hole thoroughly each and every time you place a finger down. And until we get to advanced fingering techniques, you don't want to take some random finger off. It's always straight down the flute or straight up the flute. Those are all the basic notes of the Native American flute standard scale. So. You notice that little sound I put on the end is a vibrato. Uh, it is just a vibration of me making the flute play that way. That is a technique we'll get into down the road. Forgive me, I always do it when I stop on that bottom note. We'll talk about that later on as well. Now, if this is the first time you have seen one of my videos, I have hundreds of videos on YouTube on playing and making Native American flutes. I've got countless videos on how to play this scale. It is a very simple procedure. But if you're an advanced flute player or an intermediate flute player and you're watching me overly elaborately go over how to play this scale, it's because the very beginning flute players need to hear this kind of thing. So forgive me. Stick around and like I said, there'll be a lot more. However, for those of you who are beginners, this is a technique that you really need to master. It's simply covering the holes, uncovering the holes, flute to your mouth, You need to be able to cover those holes so that it goes through the entire scale and although your flute may sound different than mine, it will sound like it is going through the entire scale the same way mine did. So long as it's made well, it will produce a sound that is similar to that. So that is how to play the scale. We're going to go over that a little less and a little less each and every class until we're finished with our 12 classes of this beginning to intermediate series of how to play the Native American flute. Uh, so please, once again, forgive me if it's too much for you, but if it's not, you know, definitely go over that a lot more than what we have. So having said that, let's start with the parts of the flute. Native American flutes, or what we call Native American flutes today, typically are North American Indian flutes. Uh, that doesn't mean that South American Indians or Central American Indians didn't make similar flutes. They did. However, what we call today is this particular unit right here. It has usually something that looks like a tie around something that looks like it's not part of the integrity of the flute. Uh, sometimes it's shaped like an animal of sorts. Uh, we've made flutes that had totems that look like menorahs, trees, dogs, ocean waves, anything, even fire, if you can imagine. So if it's got something tied up here, this is what we're talking about. This is usually just something we call the tie. Usually it's made out of leather. This one actually is made out of a, a flexible cord, which makes a good option for those who aren't interested in using animal products on their flutes. And that's one of the reasons I like this one is because it's easy for me to untie and tie back. So uh, this is the mouthpiece. Your mouthpiece may have a little nub that sticks off the end of it, the size of, say, a pencil eraser. If it does, do not put that part of the mouthpiece in your mouth. It's made to put in your mouth, and historically, Native Americans made flutes with mouthpieces like that. However, that causes wetting out, which is the focus of one of our classes. Uh, that's week number nine's class is focused on wetting out, and if you put that mouthpiece into your mouth, it may trigger the salivary reaction, which is going to cause your flute to be more likely to wet out than it would if you didn't put it in your mouth. So just put it up to your lips. That's the mouthpiece. This is the bottom of the flute. This sometimes is called the top of the flute. 
These are the fingerings. Depending on what flute player uh, you're reading tablature made by, if you're interested in reading tablature, once again, one of our classes, matter of fact, the next class, the River Cane dancing song that we're going to go over is written out on flute tablature. Some flute uh, teachers or flute makers may call this the first hole. Some of us may call this the first hole. It's really immaterial. A uh, flute tab will be written in such a way that you can see which one is which. The most important thing is that all holes closed is the lowest note, and as you uncover them one at a time, it makes the highest note as all holes are open. So that's how that works. That aside, let's go ahead and take this tie off of here so that you can see what it looks like. This is where a, a few flute makers may vary slightly. Once again, this piece is called the block. Some people call it the bird because a lot of times it has been a bird. For the most part, it's just a, a uh, piece of wood, sometimes metal, stone, but its purpose is to sit on top of the flute above what we call the track. The track area of the flute is this inside part on my flute that you can see, which basically is a track. It's a pathway for the air to travel. When you blow through the mouthpiece, the air stops right here as a petition, and it comes out of this hole. And as it comes out of that hole, this block sitting on top of it directs the air in the pathway or the track across what some people call, call the knife edge, the sound edge, the splitting edge, and some people call it the fipple. The fipple is, of course, a Norwegian word for a horse's bottom lip. Um, and so for that reason, a lot of people call this splitting edge the fipple. In reality, if I'm not mistaken, once again, I do study Norwegian, but I uh, don't live there. I believe this area here is actually the fipple, and many people call this the fipple. It's immaterial. Once again, uh, this is a splitting edge or the sound edge uh, of the flute because when the air travels under this block and goes across that splitting edge there, it creates the sound as a... That's its whole purpose. Some flute makers, uh, instead of putting the track into the flute itself, put it into the bottom of the block. This is a good technique for making a great sounding flute just as it is with, with my flute here. The reason that I don't do that these days on the flutes that I have, once again, if you've bought one of our flutes, is because that gives too much variation, too many variables into the equation. If your flute block turns this way, my flute will still play, but if your flute is in, the track is in the bottom of the block and it turns this way, it may not be so adequate to make it play. There is one other variation of flutes uh, with tracks as such as this, uh, in what we call a North American Indian, Native American flute, and that is when there is a piece of brass, sometimes a piece of wood, between the block and the flute. In that case, this area here will be completely flat, just as it would be if the track was in this part of the flute. This will be completely flat, and this is completely flat, and there is usually a brass piece that sits on top of it uh, that makes the sound and makes the air path for the, for the sound to go across. This technique was designed so that most anybody could make a flute without having a great deal of expertise in creating a track in one of two other areas. Uh, it is also a design that was spoken of inside of a book called the Ben Hunt Guide to Arts and, in the Native American Arts and Crafts, and it was in that book, once again, because it was a simple technique. Um, Native Americans typically did not have brass to use to make flutes back a thousand years ago, and for that reason, historically, you'll find uh, the track area placed in a number of different uh, facets as this and the one in here. And in some cases, you may even find pieces of wood or wax built up around there to cause the track. Um, however, like I said, the reason that I don't use the piece of brass on our flutes is because that is a third step in the equation that could possibly go bad. If you have a block sitting on top of it and your piece of brass is turned sideways, it may be causing a problem. So that's some troubleshooting there for you. If your flute, when you blow through it, isn't making a proper sound, it could be that the brass piece is misaligned. And what basically, in the long run, you want to do is to have this area completely open and unobstructed. Usually the brass pieces are made to sit over this side of it and this side of it, and they'll have uh, the track area in between. So just make sure that it lines up in a straight line and then your block, whatever it looks like, sits on top of it in a straight line and that the edge of the block here 
comes right to the back edge of the sound hole. So you want the flat edge of the block, the front edge of it, to line up with the back edge of the sound hole, not the splitting edge where the sound comes out, but the edge here where the air actually escapes. And uh, as long as that's going on and there's nothing inside of your flute and you can blow through it like that and it has a clear sound uh, of air coming out of it, and then you have your block tied down, this is another very important technique, so forgive me while I break away from explaining some troubleshooting and tell you how to tie this down. We'll get back to troubleshooting here in just a moment. The first thing you want to do is make one wrap around the block as such. You don't have to keep it super tight, but usually if you start uh, with a tight knot or a tight cord, it will get even tighter as you go. So put one finger, preferably your index finger, and I'm holding this in my right hand. I'm holding the cord. In my left hand, I'm actually holding the bottom of the cord. So once again, the cord is kind of draped around like this, like a little saddle, and I've got a long piece and a short piece. A lot of times, if there is a twist in your cord or a bend in the cord or your leather, you'll know that's where it actually sits on top of the block. So I'm holding it like this, and I'm holding this side with my thumb, this side with my finger, and I've got adequate tension on it that this block actually can't even move right now. It's not, not a great deal of tension, but it's enough to keep it from moving. So that's the first step of tying your cord on. I know that uh, a lot of people make a mistake when they're tying their cord on and they'll just kind of wrap around and hope for the best. And that's actually what it looks like when I've seen a few of them where people have retied their flute blocks. Uh, but uh, when you wrap this around, you want to keep, if you have a flat cord or leather, like this uh, cord is actually a round cord that has been flattened. If you have anything that is a relatively flat material that you're trying to wrap on your flute, make sure that you don't twist it when you're wrapping. Keep it nice and flat the whole way around. And then what I've just done is I've made one more loop around the flute and the block. And if you have one of my flutes, I will mention that we actually make a stop up here that this block pushes all the way back against. You can tell that one area of the block is slanted a little bit. That's where it faces downward or towards the sound hole. And the top of it here is designed to go all the way against this stop. If you have one of my drone flutes, the drone flutes do not have this stop. So we've got two wraps on it, and watch. Same thumb on one side and finger on the other side that is holding this cord. I can pull it tight with this hand. If you'll notice, when I pull it tight, I'm actually using my thumb and my index finger. I'm going to show this to you from every angle that I possibly can. So. When I'm pulling it tight there, now I've got two wraps on it. Once again, the block still will not move, and I'm keeping this flat, not twisting it, but keeping it flat and wrapping it around the flute again. Once again, my thumb right here, my index finger over here. One more wrap, and usually that's probably enough that... Uh, if you get four wraps on it, that's usually pretty good if it's a decent sized cord. And if you notice, as I change positions and show you, I'm actually always keeping tension on the cord. We make so many flutes, I do this naturally without thinking about it. So it may take a little practice to get the hang of how to tie this back on. But if you notice, I've got this cord, this dangling cord here, tightly gripped in the bottom of my hand, and the top of it up here, I'm as I'm pulling down like this, I'm actually pushing tension against the, the flute and the cord with my thumb and my forefinger. So that's how I'm able to do this, talk to you and show you everything and keep the tension on the cord very tight all at the same time. The next step is a one-handed knot. If you can't do this, you may ask for help. Okay, Easy peasy. You grab one piece of cord, you wrap it around, and put it in the back side there. That's a one-handed knot for tying a flute, and you'll forgive me, I always stick these in my mouth. <laughs> I don't recommend it, especially if your uh, leather is toxic or has any kind of, gosh, just any disclaimer you can throw in there. Be careful with whatever you do. I know where my flute cord's been, so it's okay if I put it in my mouth. Um, so I've used my teeth. I'm not recommending you do that. If you can find another way, though, please let me know. <laughs> 33 years of flute making at this point, uh, or at the point that I made this video. When you see the video, there's no telling. 
Uh, so I've got a, a simple knot back there. Now I can release my fingers tension a little bit. It's still not super tight. So what I'm going to do next is put a half hitch, my dad used to call it, that's what it is, which is a half of a bow. I think you guys can see this okay. I'm grabbing the long end of my cord. There's a short end of the cord. Holding my finger on this end, grabbing the long end of the cord, making a little rabbit ear up here. Yep, teaching you to tie your shoes all over again. So we've got this one little ear here, and I'm taking this cord here, wrapping it around, and if you watch, I'm poking it right through there. I can do this so quickly you can't see it, but I want to make sure I take my time and show you a couple of times because this is not the easiest thing for you to do for the first time. So I've got, and it's it, honestly when I do it, I'm usually doing it here in front of me, or I'm pushing tension against a table uh, with my chest and the flute on my chest, but that's in the shop. So here we go. Take this up like this. You have a little loop, and then we take the cord around the back side of it, wrap it around the front side of it here, poke it back through itself. I think you can see most of that right there. And I have a loop and a cord. I'm trying to show you from every possible angle here and just pull it tight. I do have other videos on tying blocks on your flutes. And of course, we have most of these videos broken up into different levels, but uh, I wanted to make this curriculum and that's the reason that we've spent so much time developing it and trying to perfect it here for you. So you now have a flute that should be in working condition. Make sure that your secondary knot is tight there. If you do that, that'll keep the first knot from getting loose. And it also keeps uh, an adequate tension on your flute and your block so that it doesn't slip around or move around too much. Weather may change this, so as another troubleshooting technique, if this guy here is kind of loose, that could be a problem. It could make your flute play an airy sound. Uh, one other thing that can cause a problem, especially these days, at the time that I'm making this video, we use um, biodegradable packing peanuts. And our packing peanuts, uh, they look and smell like Cheetos. Uh, there again, if Cheetos are still around, hopefully they are, and some faster than another, maybe a healthier version of them at the time that you see this video, but sometimes those Cheetos or packing peanuts will get stuck inside of here. It could be a piece of paper inside of the flute or anything causing a minor issue. One other issue that people have with the flute, especially as a beginner, is if you blow too hard, it may produce an overtone or cause it to overblow. And that overtone is uh, really not what you're looking for. You're looking for something that is more pleasant to the ear. So it's always best to start off all holes open, blow soft, adequate air pressure, not, not like that, and not too much air pressure. That's not what we're looking for either. So somewhere in between, and cover this hole. If you continue that all the way down the scale, and, and your fingers are covering the holes accurately, and you hear some weird note, it could be there is a problem with the flute. It is quite unlikely, in my opinion. Out of the thousands of flutes that we send out every year, uh, on a rare occasion do I find one that may have developed a crack or have a broken knot or an air leak or something that could happen down the road or even broken in shipment, of course, that uh, may cause an air leak to make the flute not play properly. Nine times out of 10, it is a beginning flute player who is not covering the holes accurately. So please make sure you're doing that if it's not producing the sound, it should all the way down the scale. Otherwise, if it's doing that, you're in good shape. Sometimes a little piece of anything, uh, if I put my flutes in a suitcase or backpack or something, uh, sometimes you might find a fingernail file that found its way inside of the mouthpiece of the flute. And if anything goes inside of here, as you're blowing through the mouthpiece, it will cause it to jump up and go through the track. A small square of paper will do that. Any number of, I've, once again, got other videos on troubleshooting uh, flutes and the things that you can see there. But if anything gets under that track, it will cause the flute to sound muffled or airy or anything as such, including water and moisture from your breath. So keep in mind when we get to uh, week nine of our flute making or flute playing class, you'll get to discover uh, ways around that, and we'll talk about that more in depth. So uh, as long as your flute's playing a good sound and everything's working great. Breathe through your nose, blow through the flute. Okay, so 
In the next class, the uh, song number one, which is a River Cane dancing song, it is a rendition of an old song that I kind of put together. Um, so it's not my song, it's actually a traditional song from back in the day that it's kind of like my version of it. Uh, it's a little bit easier for, for everybody. We'll get through that. You can find the song to download it uh, in PDF format and even print it out if you like from the online class page. Um, it's song number one, The River Cane Dancing. And when you uh, read through it, you know, we'll go over that in more in detail and more in depth. And uh, some of the techniques that we're going to be using during that song are ones I'm about to show you right now. There are a couple of really great techniques that I like as a flute player. And I'm going to tell you uh, from my own personal experience and my own personal history where I, I got some of these techniques from. So in the case of the first technique I want to show you, um, it's long phrasing. Long phrasing is when you don't try to do everything that you know how to do all at once. Okay, long phrasing is So I drew out that whole phrase that I played when I said don't do it this way. I drew that whole half a second phrase out into somewhere around 15 or 20 seconds. I'm just guessing, I'm not really watching the time, but I can tell. Um, so that's long phrasing. Long phrasing is when you're not in a hurry. I learned this technique when I was a child. I was in my teens, forgive me, youth of the world. I was a, a very young person, and I was on stage in a college performing the Native American flute, the only flute player that they'd ever heard of in my little town. And uh, so I was on stage in a college performing, and I had just seen these wonderful, uh, lady Japanese drummers who were up on stage and I was mesmerized by watching them and being youth you know I uh, was in such a hurry to get up on stage and do my best and make everything as good as I could and for that reason I played so quickly and I was so fortunate that one of those uh, elderly women who had been up on stage playing the drum before me with all her great experience and wisdom come up and says could you play a little longer? And it took me a minute and I'm like, oh, I know what she's talking about. So, and this is just a scale, by the way. And you can add some techniques in there if you have some already, but long phrasing is something that a lot of people forget. Long phrasing is what makes this flute sounds so sorrowful and melodious and harmonious and uh, as a lot of people believe a Native American flute might should sound, um, there are infinite possibilities. So don't, don't get hung up in the world of it should do this and should do that. However, as a good technique, long phrasing. <laughs> It's just when you play your notes a little bit longer. That's phrasing that is longer. So that's a, a great technique. We will go over this technique almost each and every time that we speak about playing the flute because long phrasing is a, a really good, simple technique that you can use, especially if you're a beginner. Now, as uh, going from a beginner to an advanced flute player, there are alternate tonguing techniques. Tonguing, like your, your tongue right there. When a young person starts in a middle school, elementary school, high school band, whenever you start playing a brass, a wind instrument, a reed instrument, anything like that that's not percussion, they always talk about tonguing techniques. I like to call it a pronunciation technique because I'm pronouncing the sound of my note through this flute. And you can do this with, once again, any instrument that uses your breath and your wind to play it. But my pronunciation techniques, I'm going to explain to you. There are three of them we're going to go over right now. I have and and then I have once again, I'm putting vibrato on the end of each and every note. You don't have to do that right now. We'll talk about vibrato down the road. But as far as uh, playing the notes, you'll notice I played one of them. What I'm doing is I'm starting the note by going 
That's using my tongue to create a quick start or puff of air. It's not like that, it's like that. So as I'm starting the, the puff of air, I'm not actually stopping it until just a, even a fraction of a second before I start the next one. Technically, I'm not really stopping it at all. That's a technique in band. They always call it the duh sound. It's a duh, duh, duh. And that's because when you open your mouth to say duh, you usually leave your mouth open as it continues. As you say tuh, you may keep it open, tuh, but at the same time, you're stopping it with uh, some mechanism in the back of your throat, as well as your wind box, and you know, there's a lot of things that you're doing, but tuh, the tuh sound is just me puffing a really quick tuh of air. And that's the next technique. So all I'm doing at this point is I'm starting the air and stopping the air at the same time, like saying the letter T or like saying ta. That's a longer version. Is a shorter version. And then this is the other version we were talking about previously. So you should be able to hear the difference between that and that's the difference. So starting and stopping each note or starting the note abruptly but not stopping it, carrying it on to, into the next note. The third technique is I'm neither starting nor stopping after the first note that I play. When I first put my flute to my mouth and blow air through it, I'm not starting or stopping it and I'm not even using my tongue. You can use your tongue. It's not necessary. It's kind of like an add-on. So this is how most people begin playing the Native American flute. If, once again, you're a beginner, someone who has never played a wind instrument before in your life, and you're not very skilled in controlling your air, which most of us really aren't, um, and uh, being able to control how much air you use usually is something that people who speak in public or people who play musical instruments, those are the kind of things that we learn. However, people that don't learn how to play wind instruments or brass instruments or reed instruments uh, or speak in public uh, usually, or yoga, tai chi, there's a few facets of life where you can be taught how to breathe. <laughs> or if you go to Hawaii and they call you a haole, then uh, you learn how to breathe really quick. That's important. So when you play this technique, I'm neither stopping nor starting the notes. And once again, what most people do in the beginning stages of flute playing. And make sure you cover those holes accurately. It's simple. All you're doing is blowing straight through the flute, changing the fingerings appropriately. Once again, using the scale accurately, not doing some of this stuff. <laughs> so make sure you cover the holes one at a time and keep them covered as you cover the next hole and go down. So as you're going from the bottom up, you uncover that finger and leave it uncovered, uncover that finger and leave it uncovered, same all the way up, and until we get to advanced techniques, you don't need to put a finger in some random location on your flute other than the one covering up that third finger on a six-hole flute that is supposed to be covered all the time. If it's one of the six-hole flutes that I've made, mine aren't like that. Just don't worry about that. Leave that top hole covered all the time until we get through the lesson, and we'll talk about that. But uh, this is where you want to learn how to use these techniques and put them all together. And this, of course, will conclude our class for today. Um, as you have learned the scale and how to play different three different techniques, those three techniques and the scale, long phrasing, and if you learn to vary the lengths of your notes just a little bit, this is what it can become. easy enough or you might think hey I could never do that don't think that way you can do that I promise you uh, so what I've done is I've thrown in some different techniques in there that I've just discussed the three different ways to pronounce your notes or the tonguing techniques as other people call them um, the three different ways to pronounce your notes and the scale and with those you'll basically make a melodious sound 
If you notice too, I did this other little technique here called the jumping bird technique, which we will learn on the next lesson. It is very specific to and works very well with our river cane dancing, so we'll talk about that. vibrato, like I said, it's habitual for me, so I do apologize. I could make myself stop if I wanted to. I don't want to. <laughs> anyway, uh, so if you've gotten those three techniques down and learned how to play the scale, you should be able to do that, make something melodious with the scale. We'll go on to the next class and we'll go over a song. We have uh, a class specifically on how to practice effectively, as you have seen through our curriculum. Uh, also have another song called Parts Unknown. That song we write during class, so you'll enjoy that. Uh, it's something that will teach you how to write your own music. It's not a technique I created. It's as old as time, and uh, we'll go through that pretty thoroughly, and it'll also help you stretch your techniques out a little bit and really use those uh, technique muscles. So um, we'll go through alternate scales, the major scale, the minor blues scale, the chromatic scale. We have traditional stories about the flute, how uh, to stop your flute from wetting out, and even the Blue Bear song, which is the one that uh, you hear at the beginning and ending of all of my YouTube videos, as well as um, advanced techniques for performing for a large audience. And finally, with 12, we'll go through the techniques of how to record your own music, and I'll give you a little bit of information about that, as well as free recording software that I can tell you about that is available out there all over the place for you to, to use to record your own flute sound. Having said that, this will conclude uh, this first class, uh, parts of the flute minor troubleshooting. Once again, anything that you need extra, we do have additional classes on our YouTube channel, Blue Bear Flutes, so that you can go through and learn how to do some more specific troubleshooting or more information about how flutes are made if you're interested in that kind of thing. Uh, one thing I would like to end on in this class is uh, really how to take criticism. Uh, a lot of times if you're playing for someone or someone hears you playing, uh, and this is really one of the biggest things about playing any instrument, or learning rather, any instrument, is a lot of people are very shy in the beginning stages, and that's okay. There's nothing wrong with that. That helps teach you, if nothing else. Uh, being afraid of things is what's made us where we are today, so we've, we've learned uh, how to do that. So uh, that's not a bad thing. However, keep in mind you have complete control of your fear, and in that particular case, accepting constructive criticism is not a bad thing. It really isn't. Um, people tell you, oh, that sounded this or that sounded that. And a lot of times I hear my first uh, beginning students say, so-and-so heard me and they said it sounded great. And usually it, it really does. And yes, you are still a beginner and you still got a long ways to go. But uh, there are things that people haven't heard and they really appreciate that and enjoy it. So accept criticism from anyone. You can let it bounce off of you if it's not good for you. And if it's got something that you can take from it and learn, use that if it's positive. Uh, if it's negative, trust me, it is not positive. So uh, you can, uh, once again, ignore those negative things. Hopefully nobody out there has someone telling you, you're a terrible flute player. Of course, you know, everybody has a starting point. So don't feel afraid of where you're starting and where you're going to be. So please make sure you look for my next class. And uh, keep in mind, too, we've got some other great videos on YouTube. I can't express that enough. And we hope to see you here again very soon. Charlie Montatoyella, y'all take care.